Thank you for listening to this recording of Family Bible Church's Sunday morning message. We pray that God will use this word to bless and encourage you. Well, officially, good morning again. And um, thank you. Um, we have been looking at the book of Zechariah since the beginning of September. And um, this is the seventh, um, if you would, message installment of the study. And uh, as we've gone through the study, again, hopefully you've noted that there's a whole lot of prophecy that God is declaring um, regarding both his interaction with Israel and his, his personal coming um, to, to the nation in, in the future. So there are five words of Yahweh spoken through Zechariah. We are today beginning, we're going to spend two weeks looking at the fourth word of Yahweh. And uh, the goal is for this to be done in just, I think, four weeks, I think is what we have, because the week before Thanksgiving, I won't be here, and um, Chuck will be speaking, and he won't be speaking from Zechariah. So I think we got four more weeks of this, three or four more weeks. Um, so we begin looking at the fourth word of Yahweh. Um, but before we get into chapter 9 here, as we begin to look at this, I want to go back, if you would, and I want to discuss this concept of the, um, the telescopic nature of prophecy, because this chapter is really, um, really reveals it. I had a couple more slides here, and I deleted them, because I was just going to go with this one. Um, but if you remember this, it's kind of looking at prophecy, it's kind of like looking at the mountaintops, okay? That um, as the prophets were looking out, they're, they're declaring these things that God is showing them, but God's not talking to them about all this stuff that's down in between these ridges, between these mountaintops, if you would. Life is happening. There's a whole lot of life going on, a, little, a lot of history, if you would, going on. So if you would, um, the individual there, as he walks toward that final uh, mountaintop, history is happening, right? Does it make sense? Life is moving forward. And so we still look toward, if you would, the ultimate time, not just I could die and I could go to be with God in his presence, and that's my ultimate, right? But the earth is still going to continue until God's plan is finally fulfilled. So we're looking at this from the perspective of, of what God is doing on the earth. And so if you would, if you look out there, there are all these ones. And so I talked originally about this one that looks like it's the biggest one out there, but there's still one below, beyond it. And I was going to put up there my slides from um, looking at um, Mont St. Helens and uh, Mont Rainier and, and Mount Adams and stuff, but it was a little confusing the way the mountains were, and you'd get confused. But what I want you to look at this one is there's three of them that I pointed out, because what we're going to do as we go through Chapter 9, we're actually looking at, in those sh- short chapter, we're looking at three different mountaintops that are going to go on. We're, we're looking at, originally, the coming of Alexander, and then we're going to look at the coming of Messiah. The first coming of Messiah, and then the second coming of Messiah. And it's all brought together. And what's kind of exciting about this, um, as we go into starting with coming of Alexander, is that uh, Nebuchadnezzar is extremely important. There's a lot in the Word of God about Nebuchadnezzar because of Daniel stuff. But outside of him, I really think that prophetically speaking, prophetically speaking. So Nebuchadnezzar is a lot written about Nebuchadnezzar while Nebuchadnezzar is on the earth and doing things. Okay, But prophetically, I think there's more written about Alexander than any other worldly king. So I've got Isaiah 23 on your sermon note sheets. I've got um, Ezekiel, I think, 26 to 28 on your sermon note sheets. But you can also put Daniel. Daniel... um, it has so much to talk about, about the Grecian Empire, and beginning with, with uh, Alexander as well, that, and as we're going to see here today, I think, I think, I think, I can't tell you that this is straight from God's word, because he doesn't say this, okay? But the way I see it is Alexander's a type of Antichrist to come. And the kings of Greece have been that. Because even after Alexander, and so you could go to Daniel and read about this, because hundreds of years before it ever happened, God had Daniel. In fact, this drives the liberals crazy. I know we're not talking about Daniel today, but you can go look at it. It drives the liberals crazy because there's such great detail in Daniel about the the rise of the Grecian Empire and what was going to happen with the Grecian Empire, that after Alexander died, when that horn was broken off, four horns would come up in his place, and that's exactly what happened. The four generals that were underneath Alexander wound up all becoming the leaders of the world, and they split the kingdom into four parts. 
Two of those became greater, the king of the south and the king of the north. And you can go into Daniel and you can read all this. I'm just summarizing it. It's so exciting. The king of the south were the Ptolemies and the kings of the north were the Seleucids. And the Ptolemies and the Seleucids fought against each other, even though they were all Greeks. But that's where Rome came down and partnered with the Ptolemies in Egypt. That's where you have uh, Antony and Cleopatra, who was a Ptolemy. She was a Greek, not an Egyptian. It's an amazing stuff. Anyways... But they would battle in Israel, and, and it became the land where they would do their stuff. And within one of them, one of the Seleucids became Antiochus Epiphanes. And Antiochus Epiphanes was, was so much like an Antichrist trying to destroy Israel. Anyways, history is exciting and fun. And all these details are in the book of Daniel hundreds of years before it ever happened. We're talking about Berenice, who was the, the, the daughter of one of the Ptolemies, who was given as a, as a wife to one of the Seleucid kings. And then, then he abused her and, and, and all those are details that are given in the book of Daniel before it ever happens. It is just exciting stuff. And so as we get into Zechariah 9, there are details that are given. Man, I'm telling you, you know, if you're not a believer, what God has declared prophetically in his word ought to make you one. I mean, the liberals can't stand it. They, they want to redefine the timing of Daniel's writing because there's no way that he can know all that stuff when, he's, when it was purportedly written. Unless what? Unless God gave it to him. Unless the one who knew the beginning from the end, the one who knows everything. Tomorrow's already happened. Do you get it? I just haven't experienced it. The end has already, the Antichrist has already come. He just doesn't know it yet. Does it make sense? But God does. God isn't going to be taken by surprise by anything that goes on. He doesn't just have a guess at what's going to happen. He knows it. And when we have run into passages like this, where we run into these details that we're going to look at today, um, it ought to just make you in awe of who our God is and how much he has recorded in his word for us to know. And we don't know it because we don't read it. And we don't study it. Shame on us. It's all there. The evidence is all there for us. He hasn't hidden it. We just haven't taken the time to read and study it. And ask him for his guidance and his wisdom on it. And so I just challenge you as we go through this stuff. This is exciting stuff. I hope it, it sounds excited because I am excited. When, it, when I come to these prophecy stuff, it, I mean, this is just like, just really charges me. And especially this one with Alexander and we're going to talk about Tyre. I wanted to show you a video. I, I, there's, a, there's a couple hour-long video from the History Channel that I had condensed down into like 20, 25 minutes, and I showed it during Sunday school when we went through Isaiah. Okay, And, uh, and I started looking at it. It's like, can I condense this down to even 5, 10 minutes and take 5 or 10 minutes of the message? I couldn't do it. Anyway, so I said, I'll oh, forget it. You'll have, to, you'll have to ask me for it. Maybe I can show you it or whatever. But, or you go to the YouTube, and, and that's ultimately where I found this stuff anyway. But it's amazing, and it's from a secular, secular history. Okay, or a secular framework. Okay, and um, it wasn't a Christian group that put it together, but it so confirms the word of God. Everything God declared in Isaiah twenty-three and in Ezekiel twenty-six to twenty-eight, in Zechariah chapter nine, and in the book of Daniel. It's just so amazing, and the world doesn't get it. It's all there. Anyways, so the coming of Alexander. Okay, the coming of Alexander. Um, is we don't see in name right in the beginning, but we see it when we're going to get to the second coming of Christ, that we're Javan. Javan. Okay, if you look down in there, it's in verse, uh, verse 13. O Zion, against your sons, O what? Greece. Okay, it's actually the Hebrew word Javan, where the Ionian word comes from. Okay, and so even in Sanskrit, um, in the Sanskrit, they were referred to as Yavan. Okay, so... That group, um, actually, when they begin to split, so the first time you see Javan, excuse me, is actually back in Genesis chapter 10 with the, the, the nations, okay? And he's a son of Japheth. And so they, the sons of Japheth go to the north and to the west. They are the Europeans, okay? And so, um, so the Ionians, the Javans, are, are these people, okay? And so it's translated Greece, but understand the word Greece isn't there. It's actually literally the word Javan that's there. And so, or Yavin. And so, um, so anyways, in this, though, you've got to understand some of the background here real quick. And um, um, so you had Babylon, right? And Babylon was 
was demolished by who? The, the Medo-Persians, the Persians, okay? The Persians then extended, and they became the world empire, and they pushed into the Ionian, um, the I, the Ionian um, area, who wasn't a nation. They were just a bunch of city-states. They were the, it's the Ionian territory, okay? And so they went up there, and they began to push their empire up there, and they, began, they were just wantonly killed, okay? So Alexander began to have a hatred for the Persians, okay? Um, just think about how you would feel about another nation that came in and started destroying all your relatives, okay, and slaughtering them and killing them. And so his father, Philip, was the one who then realized that he needed to coalesce the Ionian city-states, okay? And so he formed what we understand as Greece, okay? That's why the city of Philippi, it's named after Philip, who was Alexander's father. When Philip died, his son, Alexander, who was only about 18, 19 at the time, became the king. He was understood by everybody to be the leader. Okay? He was taught by Aristotle. Aristotle. <laughs> Aristotle. He was taught by Aristotle. He was a very wise and smart young man. Okay? And he, he gave a whole lot of credence to the engineers that he had, and he extorted, if you would, um, that's the wrong word, but forced these engineers to, 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 to go further and further with the, the war machines. And so the catapult had already existed. They had begun to move toward the catapult instead of being something that slings like this to actually something that shoots it. And he says, we can get more and more power out of this thing. And so they, became, they came up with the ballista, okay, which took all these ropes and intertwined them and then intertwined the ropes and then pulled on it and then just released it. And it would just send huge boulders into the air and just crush stuff, okay? And so Alexander, at the age of 20, begins to conquer the world. He coalesces the armies of Ionia together and he begins to march out against Persia. In the, um, and so... He has his first battle, okay, against Isos. We'll come back to this in a moment, against the Persians and Isos. And he, and he has a great victory. And everybody expects that he's going to then head toward Persia. But he has visions that are greater than just taking out Persia. He's now going to become the world ruler. He is going to become the god of the world, okay? He is going to become the ruler of it. So instead of he heading east toward Persia, he turns and he heads south. That's where we pick up this story. Because first, what happens is, in your text, God is beginning with, first of all, a, a, a statement against the city of Tyre. And he begins to talk about the destruction of Tyre. He says, the burden of the word of Yahweh against the land of Hadrach in Damascus, its resting place, also against Hamath, which borders on it, and against Tyre and Sidon, though they are very wise. They is actually singular, okay? It's not talking about Tyre and Sidon, actually talking about Tyre itself. Tyre began as a colony. Now, there's a, little, a lot of history behind this because it really, you understand what's happening now, okay? Tyre became, began as a colony of Sidon, Sidon, okay? The Sidonians. And so they began this like this little colony out here. But Tyre began to grow and began to become the center of world commerce. Okay? Uh, merchants and everybody would come to it. And you can go and you read um, Ezekiel 36 to 38. Where, I think it's 36, 38. Am I right? Is that what I have on your sermon note sheets? Ezekiel 36, 38? 26 to 28. 26, 28. Anyways, in, in there you'll read all about that. Okay? And so... Um, about how the merchants of the earth would, would, would come and they would deal with her and they would uh, trade slaves and, and all kind of stuff through Tyre. Um, and so Tyre began to, to become um, great and it outshadowed Sidon, which was the, was, really was his mother city. But no one looked at it anymore. Everybody looked at Tyre. And if you think about it, Solomon worked out with Hiram, who was the king of what? Tyre, okay? For all the, the logs and, and the to get Huram, who was the, the artist 
who was brought in, the craftsman who was brought in to, to do all the stuff for the, the temple of God, okay? So by that time, Tyre had already increased. And so, so Tyre is this very, very important city, okay? And so look what it says, verse 3. For Tyre built herself as a tower. This is kind of exciting, uh, or fun, because the city of Tyre literally is the Hebrew word tor. Tor means? Doesn't mean tower. It's good, though. It mean, Say again? Is it, uh, tor. Door. Door. No, no, no. What's it mean, Gerald? Gerard? Uh, tor. Yeah, sorry. Sore. Uh, rock. A rock. Yeah. It's a rock. It's a rock. It's a fortress. It's hard. And so this is kind of fun when we get to the next slide, okay? And so they built, so Sor, the rock, built a bigger rock, if you would. They were a rock on a rock is really the idea of what's happening here, okay? The idea is that they were impregnable, okay, which you'll see in a moment, okay? Um, For Tyre built herself a tower, heaped up silver like the dust. They were what? Say away. Wealthy. Wealthy. They were stinking rich. I mean, silver was like nothing to them, okay? And gold like the mire of the streets. Behold, Yahweh will cast her out. He will destroy her power where? In the sea, and she will be devoured by fire. Okay? So you gotta understand. So this is this is the um, the, the Phoenician commercial network, which was tire, okay? And so if you ever um, See Carthage here? You talk about Hannibal. He was a Carthaginian. Okay? They actually were Tyrenians. They were Phoenicians who actually fled from Tyre and went then and lived in Carthage and began their empire again from Carthage. It's really kind of fun. So when you, again, look at history, it's all kind of fun thing. They owned the sea. They had no army. Here's what I found. What did you find? Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit of a helium going on there. Anyways, <laughs> anyways, so it's funny, though. That happened to me in the car. My mom would say something. I don't know what my mom said, but all of a sudden, Google's all of a maybe going this. I'm thinking, what did she say? She didn't even say, hey, Google. Anyways, so um, we live in a different world. Anyways, the, the Phoenicians, okay, the Tyrenians, they had a huge navy. Why do you think they had this huge navy? To protect their mercantile. That's exactly right. They cared less about military. Everything was about money. 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 Jesus said you only can serve what? One God. You can decide which God you're going to serve. It's either God himself or money. Mammon. The things that money buys. Okay? Materialism. Well, they were the focus of materialism, okay? And so all through the Mediterranean, you can see all these red, okay? That's their, their little merchandise thing going on, okay? And so they had everything that was there, okay? Now, what's kind of fun is that, now this is the Google map, okay? And this is like if you went to Google right now and you zoomed in on where Tyre would be today, okay, in Israel, okay, in Israel and Syria, this is what it looks like. You see that little bit of nipple out there flooding into the, um, the Mediterranean, Okay, that's Tyre. Okay, and right here, we'll zoom in on a second. That's old Tyre. Okay, so I want you to kind of see. You can see there's the the Sea of Galilee. Okay, so this is Israel down here. There's the Jordan River coming down through here. Okay, down in here is the the Valley of Megiddo, Armageddon, where the battles will take place down in there. Okay, so um, zoom in a little bit. Okay, so there's that little nipple standing out there. Okay, and you see the the city, how the city is just ranging out into the into the, into the Mediterranean, okay? And you can see where Tyre is, and this is called Old Tyre out here. But watch what happens in just a moment, because with the, the graphics we can do, right? It's gone. So that's actually what it looked like back in this day. Tyre was a little island. It was a rock out in the Mediterranean, and so Tyre, the rock, became the rock that built the rock on top of the rock. They built an impregnable um, place. The only way you could attack them was by the sea, by ships. That's exactly right. This wasn't just a, a moat around a castle. This was the sea. It was a half a mile distance from the shore out to, to the island. 
Okay, and so then they built another wall. It was a double wall that was like I think thirty feet in in its width. So they had this huge wall, and then another huge wall, and they filled it in between with dirt. Okay, I mean it was just nuts, and I think it was like a hundred feet high. It was just a massive thing. And we were talking about towers, and then there were towers along that thing all along. So they protect. They they had themselves protected. They were like the the biggest massive castle you can imagine, with a half mile moat at its smallest part, okay? No one could touch them. Enter Alexander. Enter Alexander. Enter the prophecies of God. See, forget Alexander for a moment. He's gone. Who determined this? God did. Hundreds of years before any of this happened, God is declaring this. If you read Ezekiel, it talks about how, how God was just going he, he to wipe the, the dust right off of, the, right off of old Tyre. And there was not going to be a rock or, or, or a beam that was going to be left. And you're like, whoa, how does this happen? I wanted to go back and read all those things for you because it's just so exciting. How is that going to happen? This doesn't make any sense. Oh, this, there's no way. This, can't be a, this is going to be a failed prophecy. It's not a failed prophecy. Alexander comes down, and um, he's looking at this thing, trying to figure out how he's going to get in there. So everybody up, Biblos up ahead of them, Sidon, they all capitulate. They all capit- they're all on the, the, the coastline, right? And so they can't withstand him. They all capitulate. Alexander does not have a navy. All he has is an army. So as he's gone through Asia Minor, what we call Turkey, and he has taken Ephesus and all these other places. He's taken them with his army. He's taken the port. And once he's taken the port, there's no place for the, the boats to go. Do you get it? So he's starting to control all this. Once he gets the Sidonians, he starts to control part of the Phoenician navy. Do you get this? Because it's the Phoenician commerce thing here. And so... The Sidonians, part of Tyre, Tyre and Sidon, right? So now he starts to have a little bit of a, a navy, okay? But he still can't do this, okay? Because he's still really a, a ground army, okay? He's an army. And so he looks out there and he says, how can I do this? How can I get it? And so you know what he decides to do? Build a, bo- a mole, not a bridge. A mole, which is like a dam that, that he's going he's gonna to build. Oh, this is his, his, his thing, so we'll go past that. So he begins to build this dam that's heading out there. Now, the, the Tyrenians, they're out there on their island, and they're laughing. They're, pff, the guy's nuts. I mean, say again? Yeah, keep walking. I mean, it's, I mean, I mean so you get a log, and you put it in, and you pound it in, right? And then you've got to get another log, and pound it in. Then you're going to get dirt and rocks, and you're going to fill it out. But you've got a half a mile of this to do. They haven't got the big earth movers, you know, that you watch them move in the mountains and all this kind of stuff, and it'll take some months and years to do the work. I just drove 19, and so we used to come back and forth. And if you've never driven 19 in West Virginia, it's an amazing thing. There are tiers of the mountain that go like this. Um, and it used to be a two-lane road that if you got behind a logging truck going up the mountain, it was like coal trucks. Oh, they were the worst. I mean, it was forever because it's going around the mountain, so there's no passing zones. So you just take lunch, man. I mean, just you know you're having lunch while you're going up the mountains of 19. Cause it ain't. But now they have moved, moved the mountains, and it's three lanes going up the mountain, two lanes and three lanes, some parts coming down the mountain. And it's an amazing thing to have watched it. Alexander didn't have that. He had guys. And they're cutting down the, the cedars of Lebanon, and they're bringing them down, and they're, they're doing it. And t- tired, they're like, oh, you guys are nuts, you know, da 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 But all of a sudden, that dam starts what? Getting closer and closer. So the Tyranians decided to put a stop to it. So they took some of their ships and made them into fire ships. And they sailed them at the, the mole, which was made predominantly by wood so they had their their fire ships come and, and it burns down the dam okay and it destroys the whole work alexander knows that he has to get tires capitulation if he doesn't get tires capitulation no one else will will will, will, uh, will bow to him anymore because he's been beaten 
And so he didn't, th- he didn't realize what it was going to take, but now he's committed to this process. And so now he and his engineers, they begin to look at this thing again. How are we going to do this? And they come up with this whole extravagant plan. And I wish I had time to, to go through all this with you. But he begins to make a second mole, a second dam, that's now going to come from an angle from the north to the south because of the way the, the waves are coming in the Mediterranean. And so he's going to go with it. Instead of fighting against them, instead of them beating against them, he's going to kind of work with that as well. Now he also builds these huge, these huge towers, okay, where they can shoot from their, their catapults. So as the guys are working right behind them, they keep moving these big um, towers, these big fortress towers behind them. And so they're continually shooting. So if they, when they go to bring the boats, they beat them to it. They're shooting out from their ballistas, these burning arrows, and they burn down the ships before they ever get to them. Anyways, it's an amazing thing. I mean, all this is going to the... I I love military warfare. Can you imagine? Can you see the history? Anyways, military history. Hero, yeah. And um, you learn a lot about spiritual war by studying military uh, war. Anyways, anyways, because this battle is going on in the spiritual realm. So even this physical battle we're talking about really is is a spiritual battle behind the scenes, right? And so, it's an exciting thing. And so, all of a sudden, he starts getting closer and closer. And guess what? He makes it. He makes it. He makes it by using every scrap from old tire. Old tire is laid flat, just like the prophecies declared. There was nothing left of old tire because it was all used in here. And look, over time... All the silt has built up such that they've even built a whole part of a city on it. You wouldn't even know, but you can see right here. You can see that little opening right there? That's where the first one was. And can you see right along the edge here? It, has a, it still has a, like a, a, an embankment thing, like a wall along it. That's where the second one was. Okay? So they're still there. They're still there even today. You can see it through Google. This is just a zoom in on Google. You can see where those two moles were okay? and what Alexander did. Okay? And so... Alexander accomplished this, and he brought the destruction of Tyre. What God declared would happen, okay? That Lord, God would destroy her power in the sea. And I can go into details, and I don't want, again, if you want more details, talk to me, because I've got to keep moving on, okay? But that's Alexander when he was coming in the destruction of Tyre. But Alexander didn't stop there, okay? I wish we could go on with just that one, so it's so exciting. But back to this one map here. Alexander continued, okay? So he went through Asia Minor, he came down, and he took a period, a long period of time for Tyre. Well, the minute Tyre fell, that changed the world. Because everybody watched. Everybody saw it. And so you can see how Ashkelon shall see it in fear. Gaza also shall be very sorrowful. Ekron, for he dried up her expectation. Elsewhere in the other ones, we read about even Egypt. Because he's going to go on to Egypt now. Okay, And he wipes out Egypt. Well, Egypt saw what he did to, what he was able to do with Tyre. Nobody thought, there was no way that anybody could take Tyre, especially without a navy. And he did it. And he's only 21 years old at this point. 21 years old. And so everybody begins to fear. But look what it says about these, um, the ones in Felicia, because they're going to be devastated, Okay. It says that um, the king shall perish from Gaza. Ashkelon shall not be inhabited. When he was done with Tyre, he turned around and he came into the towns of the Philistines, of Philistia, and he began to devastate them. A mixed race, verse 6. Literally, it's mamzer. A mamzer is a, um, is a Jewish term. They still use it today, okay, um, as um, an illegitimate child. It's a child born of incest or adultery. It's a, like a, ne- a really bad term, okay? And so it's only used twice in the Old Testament, okay? And so it's not necessarily a mixed race from this perspective, but from the Jewish perspective, got to understand this is from the Jewish perspective, okay? This is going to be a mongrel race, okay? And it's going to be a stench to everyone. The Philistines prided themselves because they were the people of the coast. We think that, there are a lot of people who think that potentially they actually came 
um, from, the, from Europe or whatever by boat, and they, and they, they, they came in. And so they prided themselves for who they were. But now there's going to be no pride at all. They're, they're going to be a mongrel race, okay? Because Alexander is going to do the same thing that the Babylonians did, the same thing that the, the Medo-Persians did, and they try to mix everybody together so there's no national pride. <clears throat> That's the one thing that <clears throat> even the Philistines then were, were quick to, to bring up to Israel as well. Because when Israel fell to the Assyrians, and then Judah fell to the Babylonians, that the Assyrians did the exact same thing. They brought in, that's where you get the Samaritans from. The Samaritans were a mongrel race, if you would. And I don't mean that as, as rude, um, but that's just how the Bible has seen them. And so that's why the Jews didn't like the Samaritans, because they considered them as half-breeds. Okay? And so God's saying, the same thing's going to happen to you, Philistia. The same thing's going to happen to you. And so he goes on then, he says, verse 7, I will take away the blood from his mouth and the abominations from between his teeth. Now, this is really interesting because um, this word for abominations is almost entirely used of Chemosh and Moloch, okay, and then the, the idol itself of Ashtoreth, okay, and, and sometimes Baal. And so if you, if you, if you remember Ashtoreth, she was the goddess of fertility, okay? And so I don't want to give you thought processes here. But the, the idol that they would make would look like a male part of the body. It would be standing up erect. Get it? Okay? We'll leave it as it is. Right, exactly. Okay? And that's what, I mean, that's how, that's what they worshipped at. That's pretty vulgar. That was an abomination to God, you think? Okay, and that's what God refers to this as. Okay, and so this is the term, and He says, "I will take away the blood from His mouth and the abominations from between His teeth." It's what He's eating. It's what He's feasting on. And I just ask myself sometimes I go through because I think of Tyre and how we are so much like Tyre with with the, our materialism, but how much potentially we're like this as well with our sins of our flesh. And we want what we want, and we're feasting on them. You know, Jesus said man does not live by what? Bread alone, but by the what? The very word of God. But we, I, I don't know. I mean, if most Christians are living by the word of God, they're, 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 they're not eating the flesh of Jesus. They're eating the flesh of man. Anyways, and so God says he's going to do this. He's going to utterly, he's going to utterly destroy them, okay? Devastate them. But then the third thing is, he's going to come out, verse 8, just a quick little comment here. Don't miss it. Please don't miss it. This is a huge verse. I will camp around my house because of the army. Because of him, in parentheses, I've got Alexander, exclamation point. Because of him who passes by and him who returns. Look what happens. Alexander comes down. He, he, comes, he gets, destroys Tyre, devastates Gaza and Ekron and all these other cities, which you know because these are the cities that Israel fought with. So he's right next to Jerusalem. I mean, literally within miles of Jerusalem. And he lets it go. He doesn't touch it. And he goes into Egypt, devastates Egypt. And he comes back out past Jerusalem and he leaves it alone. He doesn't touch it. How does that happen? Because God declared he would be its shield. He wasn't going to let Alexander touch Jerusalem. How cool is that? Before it ever happened, God is declaring all this is going to happen, how this is going to work out, how this guy, he's going to come. I mean, Alexander's not even on the map yet. And he's going to come and he's going to devastate all this. He's going to wipe Tyre out. He's going to come down. He's going to devastate all of Philistia. He's going to go into Egypt. You can read again Ezekiel and you can read all that. He's going to go into Egypt. He's going to devastate Egypt. But when he comes back out and he heads over toward Medo-Persia and Assyria and Babylon to begin to take off, take this time, because you, you, you don't come through the desert. Okay, this is all desert. So if you're wondering why does that happen, no one traveled through the desert. You just don't, that's not the way you want Okay? And so every, that's why the battles always come from the north in Israel, because they always come up around. They don't come through the desert. 
Okay? And so, so when he comes back through to begin to swing over to the Euphrates, he doesn't touch Jerusalem. I will camp around my house. Think about Jesus' birth when he was born in Bethlehem. The, angel, the, the shepherds were out in the field. And what did they see? A heavenly what? It wasn't a choir? They didn't see a heavenly choir? No. A host. They saw the heavenly army. Don't you wonder why they were in fear? Yeah, because it wasn't like they had a bunch of little babies up there cheering with little wings and little harps going, oh, da, 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 da. I mean, why would you even fear of that? You'd be like, oh, this is really kind of cool. Hey, bring your friends. No, when they saw the angel and they saw the heavenly host, man, they were afraid because the war was on. And when you read the book of Revelation and you realize that the dragon was there waiting to consume the child, there was a war that was going on at that very moment. Don't you love to see what was happening in the spiritual realm when Alexander was coming through? God wasn't protecting any of these other cities. He was letting it play out. The destroyer was destroying. The destroyer about an Napoleon, Alexander at this moment, was doing what Abad and Napoleon does best. He was destroying. But when he came to God's precious possession, God said what? You can't touch this. So there was a day when the, the, the angels came to present themselves before God, and Satan was among them. And God said what? Have you seen my servant Job? Oh yeah, where have you been? He said, da, da. But have you seen my servant Job? There's none like him. Well, that's because of this. So God gives Satan permission to mess with Job. Do you get it? Satan said, it's because you won't allow me. So God said what? I allow you. Alexander had no power over Jerusalem because God was camping around it. Satan couldn't take the baby Jesus who was to come because God wouldn't allow it. Could you imagine what the war was like at that moment? Do you think Satan just said, okay, fine, I won't do it? I can't imagine what the warfare was like in the heavenly realms. That's why we're told to take on the whole armor of God. Above all, praying with all prayer and supplication for all the saints, with all perseverance. Because there's a spiritual war that's going on. When you look at history, it's so exciting. When you realize that's just what's playing out on the earth. Do you remember when Daniel was praying and the angel came, potentially this Jesus, came and said, I was on my way to you, but the prince of Persia resisted me. And then Michael came and assisted me and so I could come and I could talk to you. There was a spiritual war going on, even so that the answer that, that God was sending to Daniel would be delayed. stuff it's all happening god said you can't touch well then we move on to this second half if you would there's still two more parts but it's really a second half as a whole because it's talking about the coming of messiah and the coming of messiah happens in two parts and again israel if they're if they're understanding they're reading the word of god that he's given he can think they, they could get this because right off the bat verse nine you're thinking like where does this come from well, this is a contrast between the king of the earth and the king of the heavens. Do you get it? This is how the king of the earth does it. He what? He destroys and brings destruction. But the king of the heavens, when he comes, he's not coming to bring destruction. What's he coming to bring? Peace. That's exactly right. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, the colt, the full of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off. He shall speak peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. His transportation is going to be a donkey, the colt, the full of a donkey. We read about that in the Gospels, how that's fulfilled. 
his message. There's a message of peace. I have a lot of verses on your sermon note sheets about that. I don't intend to going into it, but you can read all these things. It's so exciting because his message of peace that he came to bring to us was declared even by the angels, right? But then it is transformed then into our message. It's called the gospel of peace. That we're actually, we're told in 2 Corinthians 5, that's not on your sermon note sheet, but that we're told that we're supposed to be ministers of reconciliation. Bringing the two back together again. Making what? Peace between God and men. That's why Jesus came, having broken down the middle wall of partition between us and Israel, so that he could make one new man, and then he came and preached then peace. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us. He came to bring peace. But he honestly, he stated it, he says, but I, I get it, that in my coming, I didn't come necessarily just to bring peace, but I came and I brought a what? A sword. Because what's going to happen? People are going to be divided over him. And it has been for other centuries, throughout the millennia, that, that people have been divided over Jesus. And there have been wars, not just rumors of wars, but there have been wars over the name of Christ. There have been so-called churches who have killed other believers in the name of Christ, setting their own kingdoms up rather than worrying about the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God is a kingdom of peace. And so he came to bring peace. It's not about our little assembly. It's, it's, not, it's not about a denomination that we might join or, or, or create. It's about the kingdom of God. Do you get it? It's about him. And he came to bring peace to the who? Who does he bring peace to? The nations. How cool is that? His dominion from sea to sea. From sea to sea. Now, what you can say is, well, maybe that's the Mediterranean down to the Red Sea, right? Maybe it's the Mediterranean to the, the Sea of Galilee. But then you get this next statement. From the river to what? The ends of the earth. That's a little bit different. Now, the first question you want to ask yourself is what? <laughs> good, good. What's the river? I don't know. I, my guess is it's the Euphrates. Um, there are three rivers that are, well, it's kind of three rivers like Pittsburgh. Anyways, but um, that, are, that are biblically talked about. Okay, you've got the Euphrates, you've got the Jordan, and then you've got the Nile. Okay? But, um, and it's really kind of fun because I'm thinking on my, as this is just coming to me right now, so in Isaiah, when it talks about Israel, she'll be one of three. There will be actually three sisters. There will be um, Assyria, Israel, and Egypt, and they'll all be together actually, in the millennium. It's really kind of fun. We think of Israel, but God declares prophetically as well there'll be one of three. But I think Euphrates is the river, okay? It always is seen as the greatest of the rivers. And um, that'll be the river that'll be dried up for um, the, the hosts that are going to come against uh, Israel. They'll come ac uh, across the Euphrates River and stuff, okay? And so from the river to the ends of the earth. So if you kind of picture... I don't have that slide up, but if you kind of picture the Euphrates being kind of like the, the boundary marker and going like this, it's kind of a cool statement. So from the river, Euphrates, and then spreading out from both sides to the ends of the earth, what do you get? Everything. I mean, it may leave out North America, South America, but theoretically at that point that wasn't even part of it, right? But you'd have all of Europe and Asia and Africa from the ends of the earth. And so... God declares that when Messiah comes, that his, the reign of peace will come. And isn't it kind of exciting? I mean, honestly, you can look at the churches who have um, done the conquests via war, but he says that he's not going to do it that way, right? So how has the gospel then been spread? One person at a time, peaceably peaceably. Whenever it was by conquest, it actually worked opposite. But then we get in the time that he's coming in power. This is the second coming. Okay? And so beginning of verse 11. As for you also, because of the blood of your covenant, I will set your prisoners free from the waterless pit. 
Return to the stronghold, you prisoners of hope. Even today I declare that I will restore double to you. For I have bent Judah, my bow, fitted the bow with Ephraim, and raised up your sons, O Zion, against your sons, O Greece, Javan, and made you like the sword of a mighty man. And so all the nations are going to be gathered together against Israel in the battle of Armageddon. It's pictured here as Greece. Because Greece, again, is going to be the picture of, so like Babylon, okay? But it's one of the world empires that are representing then all these nations together. And God says that he's going to take Israel, or Ephraim, who pictures the northern tribes of Israel, and Judah, who is the southern tribes, and he sees them as then one. They're going to be one again. And he's going to use them against all these nations that are going to be gathered against him. Okay? We saw a little picture of it, just a tiny little glimpse of it in the 1960s, in the um, Six-Day War that was in 67. And how you had multiple nations coming against Israel within six days, God had moved Israel to destroy those other nations. Same thing is going to play out in a bigger way in the Battle of Armageddon. Okay? So God's going to come with arrow and trumpet, he says, okay? And which is kind of fun because the arrow, again, represents what? The warfare, okay? And we're told in verse 14, Yahweh was seen over them. His arrow will go forth like what? Lightning. What do you think that that could potentially symbolize? I mean, we don't know because it hasn't happened yet. Rockets. rockets could be rockets. Okay. Missiles. I'm thinking it could be lightning. I mean, I mean you know, I, I mean, how did... How did Israel defeat the, the kings that were joined together against Gibeon? Hailstones. Yeah. Israel came up with all these hailstones and were shooting them out with, with uh, catapults, right? No. I mean, God defeated them from above. So it came out like lightning. The arrows were like lightning. Maybe God's going to be like, there's going to be this massive lightning storm that happens on the battlefield. And there's going to be all these guys that are dying because they're being fried to death by lightning coming down. Think about Sodom and Gomorrah, what happened there, right? So it doesn't necessarily have to be. It could be these missiles and stuff like that. But what? It doesn't have to be. Make sense? Because he says his arrows are going to be, they're going to go forth like lightning. And the Lord God will blow the trumpet and go with whirlwinds from the south. So God himself is going to call the battle to order, and he's going to do this work. And then he's going to come with deliverance and salvation. Again, you've got um, references there, Romans 10, uh, 11, where God says all Israel will be saved, okay? That God's going to come, and he's going to deliver Israel, and he's going to, he's going to bring salvation to them, okay? He says in verse 16, Yahweh their God will save them in that day as the flock of his people, for they shall be like the jewels of a crown, lifted like a banner over his land. For how great is his goodness and how great is its beauty. Grain shall make the young men thrive and new wine the young woman. God is going to do a phenomenal work. We look forward to that day. This part is still yet to come. So in the end, I ask the questions. How have you viewed the validity of Scripture? Is it truly... Not just, okay, the Word of God or contains the Word of God, but is it accurate? Is it valid in everything it says? Is it authoritative in your life? Honestly, don't just say yes. But how does it live out in your life? Is it authoritative in your life? How do you view biblical prophecy? Is it important to you? If not, why do you suppose that God placed so much of it in the Bible? I mean, it's just something I was pondering. I mean, there are people who just deny this stuff. They say they believe in God. They say they, 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 they trust in his word, and yet they deny the prophecy. If prophecy wasn't important, why did God waste all that space? I mean, why did he waste all that time? If it really wasn't, well, it doesn't really mean that. I think it means that. I think it means exactly what he says. Are you living in submission to the reign of Christ do you have peace with God? Finally, are you seeking to share the gospel of peace with others? And is there then a need to change the way you think and therefore change the way you act? Let's pray. Father, I thank you for you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the excitement that you have given to us that we might see how you declared ahead of time to validate your word, Lord, of what was going to happen. Lord, and, and, and as those things occurred, just like you spoke them, to be, Lord, all these other things are true. There is going to be a day of a great white throne judgment. 
Lord, there is going to be a time when the nations are going to rise up against Israel. You are going to come on that white horse, faithful and true, chesed and emet, written on your thigh. You are going to, to, the sword is going to proceed from your mouth. You're going to destroy the nations. You're going to write, set up your, your kingdom, Lord. Lord, we know that all these things are true. And we know then, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. In Jesus Christ our Lord, because you are faithful and true, because your word is true, you have revealed it to us, you have proven yourself over and over and over again. The liberals don't understand it, because they don't want to understand it. If they understand it, they get it. They just don't want to understand it and get it. And so they suppress the truth. They choose to worship the creation rather than the creator who is blessed forever. God, forgive us. Don't let us be like them. Lord, help us to worship you. Help us to to magnify you. Help us to to hunger and thirst for your truth, to read it in your word, to to be students, not of of men, not to read commentaries, but to be students of God. Lord, help us to believe by faith what you said when you said that you would send the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into all truth, that you actually meant it, and that you'll do it. Lord, help us to spend time in your presence being led, being guided, not by our own understandings, by yours, that you might receive the glory in our lives and through our lives. In Christ's name, amen.